All right, let's go ahead and get started and see if our third member is able to join us here. Uh, if the recording secretary could please call the roll. Right. Um, <clears throat> Mayor Rogers. Here. Mayor F Member Fleming. Also here. Let the record reflect that two members of the subcommittee are present with um, Member Sawyer to join. Excellent. Let's go ahead and start with comment on uh, non-agendized items. If you have a comment that falls within the jurisdiction of the committee, but is not on today's agenda, go ahead and hit the raise hand feature. And we'll start with Eric. Just one moment while I get the screen up for Eric. Mr. Frazier, um, if you would please confirm your ability to see the screen. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, city council members. Uh, appreciate seeing you. Um, I assume you can hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. So I <clears throat> obviously wanted to give you an update on the short-term rental urgency ordinance. Uh, the illegal urgency ordinance that was passed has had severe repercussions. Um, and a lot of lies are now starting to be exposed. For instance, there's a claim that there are some 400 STRs operating in the city. <clears throat> so far, uh, there's been about 240 applications uh, and only about 30% of them have been uh, issued an approval uh, after about four months. So that'll probably give lies, uh, rise to a claim of uh, some sort of process abuse. Uh, the claim was made that uh, STRs interfere with RENA numbers. Uh, there's no evidence to support that, uh, despite the testimony from a council member here in this meeting. What we did find, however, that RENA numbers were impacted by this illegal conversion of the art house apartment build into uh, some sort of boutique hotel. So it'll be sort of interesting to see how that is uncovered with all those campaign contributions and everything that's leading up into that issue. Um, also, the numbers are not going to be relied upon because a lot of people that were hosted uh, rentals were forced to apply as unhosted rentals. So the numbers in your reports are going to be skewed. They're skewed anyways because you really don't understand the business and you just think that if somebody has a permit, then they're doing that 365 days a year and so on and so forth. <clears throat> there were so many seniors abused by your illegal urgency ordinance that we're contemplating adding that as an additional line of attack in our lawsuit or perhaps issuing another lawsuit, perhaps a class action lawsuit. Seriously, you have hundreds of seniors that have been impacted by this illegal urgency ordinance. Uh, some of them are cat loving, that's true, but a lot of them are wondering what to do. Uh, they're selling their houses. I know perhaps this is a veiled attack on people that are aging in place in their homes. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, but the, the impact of it is severe and we're starting to get it. Meanwhile, our fundraising is going well. We are in contact with hundreds of people in the short-term rental community in the city. We're also expanding our efforts or have already expanded efforts in the county. So we know as this thing winds forward, uh, Santa Rosa will probably be in a good position to be case law for other jurisdictions up and down the state. <clears throat> uh, we'll address the BIA taxation issues when that subject is up on the agenda later today. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And if we can get council member Sawyer promoted. Yes, absolutely. Welcome, John. Thank you. Sorry about that. Lots of lots of tech trouble this morning. It's it's all good. So I'm um, on my iPad. I know, so got, it's I had to move to the iPad. It seems it's functioning now. <laughs> uh, we're just doing uh, public comment for non-agenda items. Uh, so let's see if we have any other hands for that item. We have no additional hands raised at this time, nor were there any email or voicemail uh, public comment for this meeting. Okay, let's move on to item 3.1 then. Morning, Raisa. Hello, couldn't even find the unmute button. Um, okay, so we do have a slide. Oh, 
And, and Raisa, right, so be before you jump in, I'll also just share for the public that we are polling item 3.3 for today, and we'll hold that for our next uh, meeting for uh, the committee. Right. And then um, let me just promote a couple of folks um, to panelists. I think I got everybody. Raphael, Socorro, and Tara. Okay, now I'm ready to start. Um, uh, Eileen, do you want to bring up the um, slide deck? Yes, absolutely. And um, while she's doing that, I'll just tell you um, that um, we wanted to bring this to you uh, because we are moving towards the um, contracting stage. And obviously, as we do that, towards um, fleshing out the details of the four programs that you guys, um, the council allocated ARPA funding towards. And so um, we wanted to just check in with you um, to see if you want to nudge the programs anyway, um, and um, and because we have some specific uh, questions as we go through it. Um, so uh, it's uh, sorry. I'm not sure. Um, so um, it's going to actually be a number of us uh, leading you through this uh, through the uh, presentation, um, and it's uh, it has been a, a truly a communal effort so far. Um, but I do want to say that as we go through these slides, what would be helpful is if we'll, uh, we can stop at any time to answer questions uh, and um, get some of the answers done. So don't feel like you have to wait to the end of the presentation in order to ask us questions. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Tara and to Raphael. Um, next slide, please. And um, we'll just get started with um, the Small Business Support Program. Thanks, Raisa. Hi, everyone. Tara Thompson, Arts and Culture Manager. Um, I am working with Rafael and Raisa on uh, formulating the program elements for the small business support um, component of these ARPA funds, which uh, at this point we are proposing to be kind of broken out into three areas, the qualified census tract focused business tenant improvement and facade improvement program, um, funds towards the Mercado Mercandito relocation, excuse me, and funds for the parklet build out. So I'll be walking through a couple of these and then Rafael will be joining in as well. Next slide. So for the tenant and facade improvement program, um, as you recall, we, we proposed a couple meetings ago um, that we would be working towards uh, a program that would include uh, tenant improvement grants, um, as well as facade improvements managed under contract with a arts nonprofit through the public art program. So we're looking at um, a one application program that, that uh, a business could apply for either or both programs uh, with eligibility determined by location in the census tract area, uh, proposing a 10 a thousand dollar grant uh, kind of ceiling. However, we'd like to discuss that as some of our questions to you. Um, and then in addition to the tenant improvement grant that the facade improvements through the public art program would um, add additional funds to the support. Uh, however, it would be through a contract with a arts nonprofit. Um, so that nonprofit would provide facilitation, design, and installation services for those selected projects. We would have targeted marketing and outreach to identify potential business applicants in the QCTs. The materials would be available in English and in Spanish. Collateral would be distributed virtually and in person. And we would also make sure we would hold application um, preparation meetings or workshops. Um, so our questions really at this point are looking at the matching requirements and the grant amounts, kind of looking at what, what would set up businesses for success here. So any input that you have on um, matching requirements and the grant amount. Uh, and tied into that would be another question about the areas to launch this initial program. We've previously talked about um, highlighting or prioritizing Roseland and or Santa Rosa Avenue. Um, those both are within the qualified census tracts. Um, but there's also the opportunity to say, okay, well, we, we can encourage uh, those businesses in Roseland and, and or Santa Rosa Avenue to apply and then 
other businesses within other consensus tracks could also apply, but there would be a higher match requirement. So we've seen other programs run um, similar to that where the matching requirements for the grant component would have a match requirement based on um, certain map or geographical areas within the within the map to essentially incentivize um, the priority areas that we would like to invest in. Um, so those are really the questions uh, out to you to kind of move this forward. So any input you have on that now would be super helpful. We can pause here um, if you'd like. Victoria, John, who wants to jump in? You know, the, um, the matching piece, it's kind of, a, there's an unknown here, and that is how much is it going to cost the average business to um, do what they need to do to take advantage of the grant? Um, there's, so if, if, if we do have a requirement, a matching requirement, and that will make our dollars go further, if the if the business person can afford that that match, um, on the other hand, uh, if they if they can't and the ten thousand dollars doesn't do it, then they're not going to be able to take advantage of the program at all. What we don't know is how much these improvements are going to cost, and um, maybe there is a um, kind of a schedule where you have if you if you. Uh, if, we, if we give you 10, um, that we require a 50% match, which would be another five, well, will, will $15,000 get the job done, whatever that job might be? It's each, each business is going to have a different challenge when it comes to how they use these, these dollars. So I, I'm in a bit of a loss as to know what to recommend without knowing kind of some uh, average costs that that would be able to be under the program, um, the the facade uh, improvements or whatever it might be. I mean, I, I don't have a laundry list of those those items that would be um, covered under this grant grant program. Um, what we we want it to be, uh, we want people to be able to take advantage of it, and without knowing how much these projects are going to cost. I'm a bit of, at a bit of a loss, and unless Raisa or or team, um, if you have a sense from other communities or from the trades, what these costs might might be and what it might actually cover. Um, so I guess I'll I'll leave it there. It's I I'm just not I I don't have the answers to those questions. I just had an idea based on you're not having an answer to those questions or your questions. And that is, you know, one of the things that we could include on this are the city fees, because sometimes for building permits, those can be um, substantial. So we can look at fully covering city, the cost of city fees. So that would be one thing as a starter. And then look at, because I think if, if, you, if the tenant improvement would require a building permit, um, I think there are some fees that are related to the, um, to the uh, like a percentage, or maybe it might be for engineering. Um, and we can look into this, uh, the percentage of what the actual, the full cost of it's gonna be. Um, so we can look at that, um, but at the very least, maybe it will cover 100% of your city fees um, as the base cost and then a percentage of, um, of what the total um, TIs are expected to, uh, to cost. It's a little bit more laborious in terms of um, administering the program, but maybe that's one way to do it. So we know that there is um, at least the permits are covered. Well, I, I, like, I, like the, um, the, I like that strategy. Uh, we'll know, I would think that in pretty short order, we would start to find out from those that are applying for the, for the grants. And then and I like the idea of absorbing, well, we actually, the, the, the fees would, we would give and then they would come back or we would, we would kind of deduct the city fees from, from, the, from the amount, from the grant amount. Um, well, I think we probably would find out in pretty short order what that ten thousand dollars, what what it will, what will it really cover? How 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 does that advantage someone in getting the job done? I mean, that's really what we want. We want we want success. So how to to, um, to how to attain that success 
is going to depend on how much we're able to actually uh, provide a business to get the job done. So my thoughts on it, I'm, I'm excited to see it. I think this is going to be really neat. Um, those are two corridors that I think would benefit from something like this. The only concern I have is probably a similar take on what John said, but a little, maybe, I don't know if it's different at all. What it is, is that will um, this program end up funding the business or not funding the businesses that most need it? So um, how are we going to make sure that, um, that, a bus that smaller businesses and businesses um, that are less hooked up with the city. I know that you guys are great with outreach, but how are we going to make sure that they get some of this? And how are we going to deal with some of the financial hurdles? I mean, the, the ones that can least afford to match are probably the ones who most need it. And so can we have some flexibility with smaller businesses or, um, you know, newer businesses? Yes. And I think, um, you know, specifically this, I think some of the things we're going to have to do um, in person outreach, I mean, there's one thing to say, hey, this is available, but I think we've seen consistently um, with businesses, uh, well, with the community at large, um, that those who sometimes most need it are the least hooked up. So we do have, um, have identified some partners, um, uh, community organizations, but I don't even think that's enough. Um, Raphael tends to be like get the most responses when he's actually on the street, <laughs> um, going into the businesses and talking to them. Um, and I, I think um, I think we're going to have to figure that point out, like that flexibility, um, because I think that's one of our largest. So as we've been discussing, it's one of our largest concerns. Is like you know a match is standard, um, but. Um, right now, the people, especially the ARPA money in general, is trying to get to people who, who have been left out. And um, it's hard to um, formalize um, like an official program with that flexibility. But I think right. I think we'll um, I've heard it. Yeah, and we'll, we'll keep yeah. going. And I think I think, like you said, Raisa, I think instead of saying or stating a required match, having a sliding scale of how much how much of their project budget, how, what percentage can be covered by um, by this grant fund um, based on a variety of factors. I mean, I think we could establish those criteria, and then it's a you know a sliding scale to be determined as we're reviewing applications. So, I mean, I do agree that if we say there's a match requirement, that will limit who will be able to participate 100%. So I, I definitely think that if we can come up with an alternative to that, uh, that will encourage um, encourage those that, that need it to get the support. And would, would there be, oh, I'm sorry, right. So would there be a way to, to implement a user-friendly um, needs analysis or test? What do you call that? A mean, not a means, there's a is it a means test or a, to determine their, it, it speaks to Victoria's question about making sure that those that need it most um, have an opportunity. Is there, a, is there some way to, to, to evaluate that without going into their, their you know, account, without having an analysis of their accounting procedure? I mean, I don't know if we have the skill to do that. Um, and, and, I don't, and, and I also don't want, don't want it to be so complicated that they turn and run screaming in the opposite direction. Yeah, but you know, the other thing that we can do is, um, is work more closely with like the Hispanic Chamber and the Black Chamber. I mean, I don't think, unfortunately, those organizations have um, the means, like the financial means to help, um, help with matching funds. Um, but, um, you know, I think they can perhaps most likely help us with some of these issues. And again, the kind of organizations that we're trying to, to um, involve, um, you know, probably aren't um, active participants in some of those organizations. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't, I think we can get, because we're struggling with this with a number of the other programs too, even childcare. We've, 
got it up to 75%, um, you know, um, so we're going to have to address, you know, potentially a match for it all. I think it's just how do we write in that, to Tara's point, that sliding scale and then some level of forgivability or something like that. Right. I, and I like Tara's suggestion. I mean, if you can have um, it be a percentage of the project total and then, you know, you can add in like, you know, baseline and I'm just going to make this up. Baseline will will pay for 70 percent of the project. But if you're a business under, you know, three years old or a business that um, has other characteristics that we want to see or, you know, a diverse business or something like that, then we start to add on percentage points of what will cover up to, I don't know, 90 or 95 percent of the project with a cap or something like that, that may be a real simple way to, to engage people in the way that we want to without having to get into the details. But I, I have another um, concern, which I see as actually an opportunity, which is around these smaller businesses and newer businesses and frankly, exhausted businesses too, you know, um, trying to envision what they're going to do with this opportunity and not necessarily having the bandwidth to determine what kinds of projects. I mean, I know if somebody came to me right now and was like, you got to figure out how to spend $10,000 under these parameters in this amount of time, you better get it done. I'd be like, I'm not sure if, um, you know, I'm going to be able to do that. But on the flip side, it's an opportunity for you guys to go to the businesses that you consider to be most in need of this kind of improvement and suggest things to them and say, you know, if you wanted to do this um, or something like this, you know, there are funds available for that. Has that been considered? Like templates or artists that may, may already be engaged? Yeah, I think for the facade improvement program, they don't have to come up with the project. That's why we're hiring the nonprofits. So oh, okay. it's, it's really a partnership where the city hooks them up with a nonprofit who will come in, look at their site, talk to them about what their needs or desires are in terms of an art component on their site. And then the, the nonprofit will design it and provide the artists and install it and everything. So it's really the tenant improvement component that's up to that business to decide, it, do they need a new facade uh, awning? Do they need a new sign in front of their business? Do they need, um, you know, I don't know, roof repairs? I, I, whatever those tenant improvements might be, I'm hoping that there will be businesses who will say, oh, I need to do this. This grant will help me offset those costs. And it's not, they don't have to come up with a new project. Okay. And the last thing um, that I can think of right now is just that I would um, hate for, I know you have to write rules and um, that they need to be approved, but I would hate for the rules to get in the way of the ultimate deployment of the funds. And I hope that there's some sort of clause or means by which, you know, under your discretion, um, if something doesn't fully meet the criteria, but is deemed worthy under your, your findings, um, that you have the independence to, to make sure that those funds get into the hands of our business owners. So my question, and Rice, I apologize if I uh, missed this. Are the businesses required to own the building? No. I mean, that, that's generally not, um, though, you know, we wouldn't, um, I don't think we would reject an application from um, a building owner, <laughs> um, you know, but no. Yeah. What about proof of a lease? Yeah, so my, I, I can, I can yeah, answer my, that. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Okay, so um, the idea is that it is meant primarily for business owners who are tenants only, though on a case-by-case -case basis, property owners who are opening a new business and their formerly vacant property may also be considered for eligibility. That's kind of what we started with with this framework. And applicants should have a minimum of three years remaining on their lease and provide a letter of approval from the property owner. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, my, my biggest concern was just that we would find businesses that needed this type of assistance through the facade improvements, and then suddenly the value of the building has gone up. And if they don't have a long term lease, um, not all uh, property owners would, uh, would, would miss that opportunity, right? So I appreciate you thinking about that and building that into the into the construct. You know, and we also have the issue of timing because we need every month that we wait to get the program up and running, we have the potential for losing a business. I don't know how much thin ice some of these businesses might be dealing with. And so we need to, to wherever we can, expedite the program 
to save those, especially that are that are that are um, you know walking a, th a very thin line uh, to to maintain their viability. So we, we need to, to we need to get going on it. I know that puts more pressure on staff and to come up with something um, quickly uh, that's usable. But we do have we, time is not our friend right now. But yeah, I quite. Think well, quite frankly, we're we're about two years late on this. Uh, <laughs> I do know quite a few businesses that, while they were shut down, took that as an opportunity to do the the business improvements. And obviously, uh, for many of the businesses that we're talking about, that was not financially feasible at the time. Um, but it, I, I'm with I'm with John. Let's let's go with what's going to get the money out the door and making an impact in the community. And um, the good thing is, is we can continue to, to sort of iterate to better on this. Um, so um, we'll give it a go. We'll, we'll um, uh, make some of these adjustments and put it out um, and then adjust again. Um, and then, you know, uh, it is a lot, a lot of money and not a lot of money, <laughs> um, but we are targeting it. Um, but we did, we can go to the next slide if you want, because um, what we did do is also um, pull out some of the funds to address some of the emerging issues that we think will continue to um, address this. And then um, Tara, I think you said on the last one, um, the next steps is we're, do, we're gonna enter into contracts, but we don't think those contracts will go to count, uh, council for the facade piece of it. Um, so we'll just continue to move forward. That part I think will be a little bit easier than the tenant improvement piece of it. Um, but we captured what you said. And then um, Rafael, do you wanna talk about the uh, Mercadito relocation? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, good morning, um, members of the subcommittee. Good morning, Chair Rogers. Uh, good to see you all. So I don't know if you've had the opportunity to visit the Mercadito uh, over in Roseland. It's uh, right um, uh, at the side of the old uh, Dollar Tree uh, building. So um, the, the funds uh, to relocate merchants, the funds would be destined to relocate merchants, ideally with room to incubate uh, additional businesses. But before I get to the two bullet points, I, I need to give you a little background and I need to go back to uh, sort of a few months right after the pandemic. Uh, you may recall we came and reported on, 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 on this project and um, it was at the, um, at the um, right after the start of the pandemic, like I said, um, our uh, Rosen's business engagement team worked closely with the county's environmental health and safety um, and the uh, county's CDC to help facilitate the reuse of the uh, Rosen Village and the former Dollar Tree store building. The city also granted a, a use permit for the Dollar Tree building to be reoccupied by these retail vendors who would otherwise be out in the parking lot uh, at the Rosen Village or perhaps other locations. Uh, our team worked um, to have many of these vendors obtain their business licenses and to register their operation. And then once they were allowed to uh, be inside the Dollar Tree store, this was through a, an agreement with the anchor tenant, uh, Octavio Diaz, who's the operator for the uh, Mitote Food Park, uh, they actually discovered uh, great success and the ability to, uh, and, and, and ways to effectively work uh, with each other. Uh, there were a total of 19 at the time. And even throughout the pandemic, even though the pandemic posed uh, many challenges for them, uh, their small businesses have been able to thrive inside this store. And an example of this great success has been by a lady uh, by the name of uh, Margarita Garcia of Arte Mexicano, who is now uh, just opened a, a small boutique shop um, at the Santa Rosa Mall. So she has the store, uh, the retail shop at the, the old Dollar Tree. And now she's opened up at the, uh, at the mall with the intentions of, uh, uh, of, of expanding. So great success there. However, um, they all knew all along that this was a temporary solution. Um, uh, the group uh, has been giving a notice to vacate uh, due to the upcoming schedule, uh, the demolition of the Dollar Tree building to give way for the mid pen apartment complex, which I think is set to begin at the beginning of next year. So the group of vendors reach out to, uh, to our team just recently for some guidance and assistance in terms of finding a new location in the Rosen area. As you can imagine, that also poses some challenges. The area is saturated with tons of businesses, food trucks, lots of people, lots of activities, and so on. So they feel um, 
but they also feel that they the group it, it's important for the group to stay together and they have realized what an what an important business model this is not just for themselves but for the city so our team with the assistance of our vice mayor our director uh, uh, of uh, economic development, of course, Raisa de la Rosa. We've been actively speaking to uh, uh, other property owners that may know of vacant uh, buildings or warehouses in the uh, along the um, Sebastopol Road corridor. So far, uh, we have come up with some leads, so we are entertaining uh, some discussions. And we're also speaking, this is also another important element of this whole uh, project. We're also speaking to some community partners that could potentially become the physical sponsor for this group and eventually represent them, represent them. Because what we're learning is that um, once we're speaking to some potential um, uh, property owner, they wanna know that they're dealing with just one group, what one individual and not necessarily a group of 12, 13 individuals. Um, the group is also committed to, to forming as, a, as a, an association and therefore establish credit and so on, membership, but that will come later, but we're also assisting, assisting in that endeavor. So uh, the intention is to set aside to address tenant improvements and potential lease needs and to seek, uh, to seek this uh, physical sponsor slash community partner, such as perhaps the Hispanic Chamber, Crescer Capital, um, Community Action Partnership and, and a few others. Um, so the proposed budget is between $100,000 to $250,000. And just want to see what uh, your thoughts were on that. So again, this is just taking out because we recognize the current opportunity. I think Rafael said they have till April at this point. There are a lot of discussions happening on this, um, a lot. Um, and we're really running into uh, difficulty trying to find them a place in Roseland. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what the implications would be to move them if we have to look outside, outside of the Roseland, uh, the Sebastopol area corridor. Um, and this triggers like a number of other things for us, which is, um, you know, displacement <laughs> as we do development, um, what's available, um, et cetera, like who's getting the opportunity to be where within the, um, within that uh, corridor where they, where they sort of were, uh, the businesses were formed. So. Yeah, I'll just jump in. It, it's a really ideal site where they are now. It's um, too bad. And I'm really glad that you're working actively to prevent the total displacement of this valued business asset. Um, so the money would go to um, maybe perhaps securing a lease or forming an association or what kinds of, in what ways would it be deployed that we could look back and say we're helpful in preventing the displacement? Well, um, Rafael, you can jump in here as we want, but we've been talking about what that might look like. And originally it was specifically tenant improvements because like, if you look at what, what they had to do within um, the old Dollar Tree, um, they did it without building permits because it was within six months and they didn't change, it, they didn't do any physical changes to it. So we were really able to do it. Um, we, the kinds of places that we're looking at um, would probably need um, some large tenant improvements um, in order to fit the, the spaces or to uh, change it to accommodate it. Um, so that was one part of it. But the other part, as we're looking at it, it's a group of people who are losing the one uh, business that's holding it. So um, like who's, uh, they pay the rent for it but it's through one person with, with um, the insurance, et cetera, covered in that way. Um, so we're also looking at those needs, like for one year, if we can, um, it would, we'd have to work with a nonprofit because I know the city doesn't want to hold the lease, but could we work with um, the Hispanic Chamber or Crisair, as um, Rafael said, to sort of be that agent and then uh, fund through that organization. So we're really open and we know we have um, probably till this summer to figure it out. So it won't necessarily affect um, the two years in which we have to expend the funds. We can divert it if we're not successful, um, but, but we're trying to throw as much as we can into it to be successful. Okay, thank you. 
I mean, and I have to just throw this out. The other thing that we want is not just to help these businesses, but that to make it a, an incubator. Um, so there's one thing to move the businesses that are there now. There's another to make it open and available to others. And that's another kind of thing that we're struggling with. Yeah, I don't think we can emphasize enough how, you know, what a success this has been and how important it is for uh, our community, but also to to keep it, if we can, in Roseland on a high traffic strip, because I think that, you know, you've highlighted a few of the things that work. And one is the business model and then the having the support of the other vendors. And then on top of that, being in a really high traffic area where people can come and get a quick bite and look around. And so, you know, I, I really do have major concerns that if you take the, the business out of the, that area or change the conditions significantly that, um, that we may lose some aspects of it. So thank you for your efforts. Yeah, but if we can't, there's not a lot there. <laughs> We're running out of, out of facility options. I know. Have, uh, Raphael, have you or Raisa or whomever had a conversation with a landlord that could stretch out the tenant improvements by, in, by with the rent? Because there's all sorts of creative ways to deal with tenant improvements. I mean, the sometimes the, 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 the well, the landlord can do it all, but you're but the tenants are ultimately going to pay for it because their rent is going to be per square foot is going to go up because the landlord did all the TI. So, um, have have you, have your conversations gotten to the level of that kind of specificity where you're actually talking about a strategy and how the um, how that how the association um, might spread out the payments of the of, of the tenant improvements to make it to make a particular property more interesting to them or viable because um, it would be to to leave Roseland. It, it, I mean, not only does it kind of put a knife in the heart of the of of that that community because of the, the nature of this of this business. Um, but what is you know what is Plan B? I mean, if there's if there's no space, then there's no space, and it's, it's kind of a uh, it's un, it's unfortunate. But and you don't want to be moving a business around because people will lose track of it. If it were to go downtown, for instance, I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, and then a, then a business became available in Roseland. Now there, and then they would like to go back. It, it does complicate things quite a bit. Um, have you been able to have conversations with enough landlords in Roseland to know that there might be something like right on the horizon where this a particular business for one reason or another was going to be closing their doors? Um, and the, so we would like you to know that we have a business looking for a space. Has, has your outreach become gone to that level? Uh, well, with the we're hoping to have this conversation with the owner at the property of 330 Sebastopol Road. There's uh, just has been a lot of um, um, you know leaving the phone messages and going back and forth and um, setting up a time to actually explain a little bit more in detail. Um, so we hope to get there with this one particular this uh, property owner. And we're gonna to have to circle back with another owner at 1733, which is well, uh, not to get perfect into details, though. We don't want to that... give the specifics of the addresses. I mean, really, what we're doing is working. We uh, have a local uh, 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 realtor who's from the area, who is, who knows the owners um, and is a com commercial broker as well. Um, and so, um, I uh, Rafael's identified a number of um, properties that are either vacant or um, look like they have some capacity includes warehouses. Mm. Um, so we haven't gotten into the specific level of detail that you're talking about because it's, um, we, I mean, I should say we have, but it depends on the site we're looking at. So we are in deep with the, with the realtor who's helping us um, find spaces. And then each individual space, depending on the uh, property owner, um, that becomes a negotiation. We've also even looked at the possibility of working again with Crosair. I mean, these are simultaneous ongoing conversations, but um, you know, that's a, um, a community um, funding organization, right? Um, so um, at the possibility of purchasing through them uh, a site that might, so like everything is on the table. 
um, with a very, very short period of time. Uh, and again, I have to give huge kudos to Raphael because he's literally walking and identifying and then personally going out in person to seek um, the owners and the managers of these properties. And they're very uniquely different. Um, so we're even looking at the possibility of an underutilized space. Um, what would it take to find a better space um, to move like a, a warehouse full of, um, of files that, that, <laughs> that they need to keep? Can we find a better space um, and then help pay for that? I mean, we're going deep. And then another idea that Tara had is, you know, perhaps there's a shipping container village, but we need a site for that as well. I mean, everything's on the table with the priority of keeping them in Roseland. Sakura, did you have something that you wanted to add? Um, okay, you just popped up. So it's a complicated thing. Um, so we just want to, on this one in particular, we wanted to keep you appraised at what we're doing. Um, another part of the conversation is um, working with the CDC to see if that's the actual, if April is the drop dead deadline. <laughs> Um, or can we expand it a little bit to, um, to uh, uh, have a little bit of uh, grace and space in order to find um, another location? I, I was going to ask about that because it seems a little, I mean, I, I don't know what it's like to, to build out an entire neighborhood, if you will, um, uh, mid-pin, you know, they do what they do. Do, what kind of flexibility might they have? I'm glad you're pursuing a little bit, as much of an extension as possible. And to say that they need to be out by April uh, to start, did you say um, the, the first shovels in the ground in next year? Yeah. Okay. But, that, that, I mean, to my mind, that sounds premature, but I don't know what they have to do to get ready for a, a, a project of that size. Yeah. And there's definitely phasing, um, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's go on to the last thing because this was the uh, last portion, which is in response to current um, issues uh, that we saw uh, opportunity around um, with, with the tenant improvement of the small business um, uh, funds. So Tara, do you want to take this one as well? Sure. Um, so these, uh, this is the parklet um, program that uh, will be coming before council soon. Um, we uh, are looking at using some of the ARPA funds for grants to offset the costs of the year one fees of the parklet program. Um, the proposal would be to have 50 to 75% of total fees for the year, the, the initial year, um, covered by the grant, determined by design elements that could include public art. So we, again, it would be a sliding scale, a certain percentage of total fees covered by the grant determined by certain um, components or design elements um, like public art. Uh, the public art program would be involved with this one as well and would con uh, contract with artists to design artwork and to install um, for participating projects. So again, emerging need that we've identified that could also benefit from um, some structured uh, grant funds as well as a component, a public art program component. So happy to answer any questions about it. I said, essentially the, the goal of the parklets in general, which we feel is in alignment with the, um, the kind of goals here would be to broaden the potential for the public right of way and create vitality and activity in commercial districts and residential centers. Um, so happy to answer any questions or any feedback. And um, just real quickly, we are anticipating going back to council in mid-April, I think, um, or in April in general for the for the next phase of the park parking program. So again, this is a little bit tied to that. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll jump in. I'll just say that I I've been a big fan of the parklet program, and I know that the public has as well. So I know that there's two kind of components of of this this discussion. It's what's coming back to council. We've got to figure that out, and then also the objective standards and adding art and adding the, the visual um, appeal, uh, particularly as, as people are kind of more out and about and as we go into the, the spring and summertime. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big fan and, and I appreciate the thought that's going into it. You know, I agree. And one of the things that popped into my mind when I see those beautiful um, uh, 
what the, the projects that are, that are in place, I'm not sure where that is, were those two examples that you showed us. Um, the first thing that I think of is, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the dark cloud of vandalism and which brings me to um, security, which brings me to cameras, which brings me to what, how, how we might want to have both of those programs in place potentially uh, to minimize, if not probably, if not eliminate, um, damage to these parklet uh, designs that, that from the ones I saw um, would, could easily lend themselves to, to some kind of vandalism and at the same time be expensive to repair. Um, but the, the, the kind of energy that they would create, uh, regardless of the dark cloud, um, I think is great. I, I, I agree with, with Chris that this is um, something that could really be, could re revitalize and uh, help them get through that first year because from what I can tell, um, regardless of the need for to, to have these fees um, placed on, on the business owners, they are not small. And uh, the, you take the, the permitting and all of, all of the fees that we, that we have seen and add that to um, maintenance, um, maintenance of these parklets, which probably is not cheap. Um, it, it starts to chip away at the viability of, of, a, of having, you know, our merchants decide to, our restaurants decide to participate. So um, I just think any, any way we can come up with a way to help protect these investments, which is really what it is, um, then I, I would be interested in, interested in having that conversation. I, I know that, that the, the downtown subcommittee is talking about security and cameras, et cetera. Maybe um, as we move forward with the park program, we need to expedite that other conversation so that we can uh, give the, the merchants a little higher sense of, of uh, higher level of security potentially um, to mitigate what we, you know, could almost bet on happening. On the plus side, to turn your frown upside down. Thank you. Years of, um, of uh, parklets, you know, in cities that have um, even bigger issues than we do, Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose, Sacramento, um, but also even regionally um, in uh, Petaluma, they have some really um, uh, uh, pretty parklets that um, meet the standards of what we were, we would be looking to do, which are flush with the um, side uh, sidewalk um, and have artistic elements. Um, and even in those in the last year and a half or year or so that those have been built have not had um, big problems like uh, to where they're um, uh, but you know, any destruction or anything like that um, has been an issue. Um, and then in um, San Francisco and Oakland, um, in particular, they're public parklets. Um, so any member of the public can um, be in them. And there isn't um, a, a ton of, I mean, it has not, that issue has not risen uh, to be a, a, a critical point to where um, it's affecting the programs. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. You know, Raisa, you and your team um, have really accomplished something in short order that has been a longstanding desire of many business owners and the council. So I think before we get into like, um, you know, what could be better, I think you ought to take like a, you know, a victory lap and all the folks in the building and the fire departments who, who make this happen, you know, it's, it's amazing what can happen quickly when there's um, great people doing great work. So I'm really impressed with your team and, um, what I did want to talk about a little bit is one of the things that I think um, is the other dark cloud of these, which is some of them are just, you know, have these, um, these, uh, the temporary structures, the tents, which in my mind is probably a more common problem than vandalism is just um, blight. And so it'd be really interesting to see if we could either remove fees or condition funding on more durable and um, less flimsy aspects that make these much more attractive. I think that's really the element that stands out to me 
is the thing that differentiates um, the ones that look nice from the ones that don't. That in art um, would be the use of durable and um, and uh, not using temporary parts. I think when we're using things like tents, it really just lends itself to looking pretty run down really fast. I'd be interested to hear your opinion on that. Oh, well, that is 100% the reason why we were trying to, um, to get to a permanent program, um, because it's not only that, I mean, those were really set up by volunteers specifically and very quickly in mm -hmm. response to, um, to the uh, health uh, requirements of uh, shutting down the inside. So they are not meant to be permanent, and they are starting to feel um, run down permanent, and we are looking to, um, to shift that. So when we uh, finally bring a permanent uh, program or an extension or some kind of modification of the current program to council. Um, included in that will be a six month leeway in order uh, uh, for those businesses that want to keep them to become ADA compliant at the very least. Um, we don't have design standards uh, built into it uh, because we don't have a quick pathway that wouldn't add um, substantial cost to it. Um, but we do have, um, or we will be recommending within uh, the, the program, you know, you can't use um, uh, like picket fencing, you can't use pallets. Um, there are requirements about awning uh, material. Um, and they're, so we're looking to elevate through, through uh, the next phase of this program, some of those issues that 100% has to be taken away um, what, what exists right now. Um, awesome, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And I think the, the other piece of this that is really critical, this, um, you know, all elements of these, um, they're all, we can pivot quickly with them um, if we're seeing that either one, you know, it, the delay maybe in parklets is too long um, and we need to get the funds out. So it's 100% um, uh, we're able to pivot and put it back into the core program of the, of the facade and um, tenant improvements. Okay, good to know. I like that. You know, even though we didn't handle it the other day, um, we, uh, the item was pulled, the staff report and the presentation did a, a pretty darn good job of, of articulating some of the, the very issues you're talking about, Victoria. Um, they, they were, took a heavy look at kind of the, the, the blight issue and the, the, those temporary tents. And though they, you know, they understand that, that it, it's not going to happen overnight, um, they did, it appeared that they tackled most of those kinds of issues, which was, which was good. I mean, it's, it was expensive. I mean, that, that is a concern of mine are the, are the fees and how many people will actually be able to take advantage of it. Um, but we're kind of, I think we're kind of stuck uh, with some of these fees that because of the, because of the parking that we're taking away, et cetera, other, other reasons, but the, it looked like a pretty comprehensive program. I, I think that, that, you know, ultimately when we do see it, um, I think most people will be pleased by the, um, kind of the, 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 the changes that have appeared now to be necessary. Yeah, no, you're right. That's good stuff. And it hopefully it will come for our council really soon. Yeah. Um, so uh, we can move on to the next slide, um, which is a totally different program. Uh, and, you know, as always, you can continue to give us um, additional feedback on, um, on any one of these. Um, so um, this is now the, we're uh, going to go into the child care support program um, pieces of it. So I think for the ARPA portion of the child care facility fund, um, which are grants only, um, there's not too much new to tell you because I think the, you know, the foundation of the program has been brewing since we received the original $2 million um, from the general fund that established the child care support program. Um, so um, for this, um, I believe we're scheduled on the consent calendar to bring the professional services agreement with first five, uh, who's going to be the administrator of the, the programs. I think we're uh, set to come to council on April 12th. Um, and that agreement with first five uh, includes three elements. And one is the $2.9 million facility fund grants, which you see here, which we'll talk about, um, as well as the, the remaining $1.4 million um, for the zero interest facility loans um, that are the general fund portion of the facility grant program. And then um, the other part of the contract that we're bringing is the administration of the child savings account um, 
but um, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, so for this specifically, providers have the opportunity to apply for really anything that is facility related, um, indoor and outdoor, so long as it is to build or enhance an environment to create uh, or increase program quality to promote um, optimal, optimal uh, learning outcomes. So um, we set it up so that the grants can cover up to 75% of the total project cost, though uh, priority points will be given to facilities uh, that um, focus on infant or at least have some portion of their program that is infant and toddler oriented, because that's where we see the highest need. Um, and then uh, in, terms of, in terms of eligibility, we're prioritizing um, you know, some uh, organizations over the other, but it's uh, basically local uh, education agencies, um, uh, 501c3 uh, nonprofit organizations uh, that operate state or federal subsidized programs um, like Head Start, um, also um, private childcare pre and preschool operators, um, but we want them to, um, to have, at this point, at least 50% of enrolled children, um, uh, I should say that the childcare provider accepts AP vouchers on needs-based scholarships for at least 50% of the kids um, in the program. So that's how we're kind of hitting that QCT mark. Um, and that's gonna be the first um, uh, run out the gate. Um, but uh, in terms of the qualified census tracts thing, that's part of that ARPA requirement. Um, again, while we have facility, uh, so, sorry, points, extra points for facilities that provide um, certain needs or meet certain targets, and we're not doing it as a location-based grant. Um, so, uh, so it opens it up anywhere. Um, we do have some uh, providers, uh, some new facilities, ground up facilities that are um, waiting for us to finalize the agreement and to get this portion of the fund out. Um, so we know we have at least three facilities or three developers who have a portion of their facility that's going to be dedicated to, um, to child care. Um, and so those um, providers are anxiously awaiting um, these funds. Um, so if you have any questions on this one, that's it. Yeah, right. So I asked this when we were uh, doing it from the dais and talked about ARPA. Uh, what level of coordination is going on between the city and four C's on that program? Well, on this one, um, so um, four C's, we've had conversations with them, but this is really a facility grant. So four C's would be a, a, a recipient. So they're informing what the, um, or could be a recipient because they're a service provider. They're informing um, what the um, grant would be. I think the question for four C's was more related, like I think they had a lot of questions or concerns about a different program that didn't get funding, um, but for this one, they're 100% eligible and informing what the grant looks like. Yeah, I think it was for both because aren't they, uh, aren't they mostly also conveners? I think, don't they have the state designation for convening child service providers? So wouldn't they be one of the people that we would talk to in terms of what individual providers need access to the tenant improvements or need access to the program funding? Yeah, so they, they're, I forget, um, Melanie Dodson sits on, I want, it's like a um, leadership advisory uh, subcommittee or something of the, of, um, of the uh, first five program. I, so she, she is, um, doing that, she is participating. We, we are not um, doing a second um, uh, contract with 4Cs um, to duplicate the program out of both things that it we're just consolidating it through first five. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question exactly. So I, I it, it, yeah, I, I would ask that you talk with 4Cs because I, my under, yeah, you just make sure because my understanding is that they would not be applying for the money. They are the convener. They are the designated convener of service providers from the state. So they would be the ones who would be working with the individual child care facilities to say, you have access to this type of money. Here's how you can apply. Um, I don't think it would be them as an organization that would be applying for the money directly. I think they would be linking us up to the businesses that would take advantage of it. So that's 
and, and I and I know that there's kind of this this quasi you know first five I know also convenes programs, but they're the designated one for our county related to child care services by the state. So that's why I just want to make sure that that they're fully in the loop and that we don't have any miscommunications about who's doing what. Because as I understand it, they'll bring in the people that we would be working with with the funding. Yeah, um, I will. I did meet with um, Melanie. Uh, it was a great meeting. They are just an amazing organization. Um, so shout out to Four Cs. Um, but I will circle back with her, and then um, and, and then also um, with her and Angie to make sure that if if we miss some piece of that within this grant, to be able to fund organizations who then um, would have additional access to providers, we'll make sure that that's part of this. Yeah, I appreciate that, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you don't have any uh, questions on that, we can go to the next one, which is also part of that um, for, uh, first five uh, contract. Um, and that I think is, yes, the child savings account. And this is why I have Socorro on, um, because although um, we're sort of managing it through um, economic development, um, Socorro was uh, part and parcel during the budgeting process and helping um, to, uh, to uh, figure out some of the components of some of these. So um, Socorro, I can either hand it over to you or I can give the high level um, view of it, but the, the, we have a couple of core questions specific to this and the use of the funds. Um, do you wanna um, present, Socorro, do you want me to? You can go ahead and then I'll chime in. Okay, so um, so the, the child savings account is an existing program that we are um, that's run through first five that we are seeking to uh, leverage. So they can administer it, um, but our core question, oh, and the and the crux of the child savings account is that um, at base, um, the program gives $200 to every eligible child. Um, and then um, from there, families particip participating in it can get additional funds by doing certain things. So they're incentivized to, um, to take classes and um, participate in um, other support programs that add incrementally up to $300 to the, um, to the initial $200 deposit. And then of course they can add to the savings account on their own. Um, so the funds are then held in trust for that child and then are available for withdrawal after the child graduates from high school. And then um, like any other um, 529 uh, program can be used in multiple ways towards the um, education um, of that child. Um, and so our core questions specific to this is, do we want to, um, for those uh, children uh, who, who reside or in the, within the city limits of Santa Rosa that have existing accounts, do we want to increase those, match the funds, or do we want to expand the program and do to a $200 base for a, a, a number of additional children? Um, and so I think that is, uh, we can also do a combination of the both, um, but that's the, that's the core question on this is who do we want to target it to? Is it new, expanding the program, or existing, doubling up what the existing kids get. And Can so I ask? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, which is, um, do we have data? I mean, I know a lot of this is about collecting data and being able to demonstrate that these things work and I'm all for that, but do we have data that led us to these dollar figures or do, are we just throwing something out there, um, which is not, but no criticism here. It just is going to inform my next question. Um, in terms of two hundred dollars, is there logic behind it, or is it just what we have? I think we're going off of the infrastructure already established because the state is taking on this same kind of mechanism to drive more and allow more families to get students to college, and so we're following the model that has been established, assuming, quite frankly your question, uh, Council Member Fleming, that they have done some research and feel this is kind of a threshold point for these types of investments at this age. Okay. And is there um, similar um, logic behind the ages two to five? It's so the goal, one of the co-goals of this whole thing, besides the economic development of this fiscal resource, is to shift trajectories 
within right. the family. So capturing that age mm -hmm. before they enter the K-12 public school system to really allow families to grow in opportunity and choices throughout the system. That's why they target that age range. Some places do go as low as birth. I mean, there is some that goes lower. I think this is just kind of like a capture plan to get as many families as possible because of course the broader the the opportunity perhaps the fewer the families that can participate so uh, right. I think it's just narrowing down kind of where will we begin in Sonoma County. Yeah, and it's a great it's a great age in terms of you know you can start in really simple terms to explain to a child you know that there's you're going to be starting school now you're hopefully already in preschool or daycare and that there's support for you to continue on. Um, in terms of expanding or adding to it, um, that's a really difficult question because, of course, you want to make it be that it's enough that it really feels like an incentive. And I love the idea of getting parents into classes. But there's one concern that I had that I think could maybe be part of an answer, which is, you know, let's say I've got a six year old daughter and a three year old son. So he gets money. And I say to my daughter, you know, too bad, you know. <laughs> You can go work at, at, you know, whatever job you can figure out, but but your baby brother gets to go to college. And so if you were to expand, I would consider expanding for, you know, school age children, maybe up to a certain grade in the same family, because that just to me, just I can only imagine I have a three a brother who's three years younger than me and that um, I would have been so upset if he had had an opportunity that I didn't have. I know any of us who have a sibling out there can just imagine what could go wrong. So that might be my suggestion of how to proceed. And then that way you're investing more in, in the families that need more families. That's yeah. a great point. Yeah, I, I guess um, one of my feedback and it's, it's a little bit of a, um, it's a little bit of a nitpicky one is I'd like to see the program branded with Santa Rosa on it. And I know that the partnership is through First Five, but this really is the city of Santa Rosa investing in the city of Santa Rosa. And, it, and it, I'd like to continue to push other jurisdictions to do the same thing, Bernard Park, Petaluma, Sonoma, Sebastopol, right? But when people just see Sonoma County First Five, you know, First Five Futures, it really does ignore that Santa Rosa is stepping out and making this investment in our own community and so I just it's nitpicky I know I get it it's all for the good of, of families but I think it really does need to reflect that this is the city of Santa Rosa making an investment in our disadvantaged communities I think that's um, an important message and it, yeah. it's so noted and yeah and I, I just couldn't agree more with you Chris and especially around like community engagement if people feel like we're engaging with them and by funding their children's futures, we have a whole different trajectory with our, our residents. Yeah, I, it, to, me, it, to me, it says the city cares, right? Yeah, the, absolutely. The, the, the city cares to change the, the trajectory for kids. Absolutely. Yeah. We, Very uh, valid. we can do that. And I think we, uh, we, uh, we modeled it a little bit with the original grants that we um, popped into the resiliency fund um, that was definitely branded um, with Santa Rosa. So 100%, I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any other John, anything no you've covered it and I love that last part as well I well, both um, Victoria's and your comments are well taken I think they're both really really important things to, con to, to consider and it sounds like very doable so um, yeah good job yeah very smart so um, similarly, then I'm going to go straight into uh, guaranteed basic income because I don't have a slide on this, but um, it's um, some of the same issues. What's interesting about this one is we don't have an existing program, but but we do have a number of other cities who are kind of trying to follow suit um, and are at different stages of um, of development of the guaranteed basic income um, program. Um, we have been meeting consistently with um, Human Services Department to try to figure out. Um, the elements and details of this um, through their ARPA program because we're trying to align it similarly, but they're not, um, their ARPA funding is not on the same timeline as ours and they're following a very different model. Um, and so that's affecting what we're going to do. And um, I'm looking to try to streamline it to go a little bit faster while acknowledging what the county is trying to do. And that's not, that's 
kind of similar to what um, I think Healdsburg and Petaluma potentially, um, they're starting to talk about it as well, what they're gonna do. So originally we were looking to um, contract with uh, Human Services Department with the county um, to administer the funds. Um, the county has, subs or HSD has subsequently come out and said that, um, that they have a role, but they should not be the lead role. Um, and so the questions that they're grappling with now is if they're not the lead role and these cities are rolling it out independently, um, how do we do a, a, a countywide kind of program? How do we leverage each other without having separate um, payments and processes and, and et cetera? Um, and then um, how do we also uh, work together to get additional funding from the state? Oh, Sonoma, I think, is also looking at this. So like um, all of the cities are looking at it. Um, so at this point, um, HSD is having first five submit the um, application to the county for the ARPA funds. Um, so uh, what we're looking at now is, um, is uh, contracting again with first five for the administration of the city's portion of the guaranteed basic income um, because they could distribute it um, and then they have the countywide coordination um, element of it. There's three parts that we've been discussing. Um, one is at the administration of it, tracking, compliance, um, return to source is a big one um, for all of us um, and federal reporting as uh, not just from them, but also the city's requirement of federal reporting. Um, the county is looking at setting aside additional funds because it is pretty laborious for this one, um, setting aside additional funds um, to pay for that portion regardless of who's running it. So like in Healdsburg, it's Corazon Healdsburg. In Santa Rosa, it might be First Five. Um, in Petaluma, um, I don't remember the name of the organization that's looking at it, but um, it, uh, county funds would help pay for the administration on that and the coordination on that end. Um, the second piece of it is evaluation. So the county was also looking at, I think this is gonna be built into the application from First Five to the county at uh, data tracking, um, they are looking at hiring an external evaluator from the outset so that we can monitor this and then be better positioned in the near future to get additional state funds potentially. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that was it. I mean, because there's a big uh, discussion about who's going to be the, the, the main liaison and coordinator amongst all these programs, um, both incorporated cities and, and um, unincorporated. And then the last piece of it, obviously, is um, the, the program itself. Um, uh, so for us, again, um, it, it's looking like it's probably going to be first five, which is going to be an easier contract. Um, but we are looking at um, uh, working with Corazon. Uh, I think that they, they've done a lot of research at this point on what the amount um, per family amount is. Um, and they were looking at $500 a month per family um, regardless of the number of kids. Um, and so in Healdsburg, it would be uh, 50 families for two years. For us, it would be, I didn't do the math, um, but um, you know, some similar amount. Uh, and then the county has begun to acknowledge that we would get additional funds you know, proportional to the size of the number of kids that or families that we have that would qualify for this. Um, so that's where we are now. Um, uh, there's still work to be done. Uh, we're trying to get um, something to the point in like April and May so that we can, um, our goal was to launch something by July 1st uh, and then to have um, those funds obligated, but giving um, through two years of those funds. Okay. And then just, just briefly, uh, my comments on the previous one kind of stand across all of our ARPA things, right? I want to make sure people know it's Santa Rosa investing in Santa Rosa. The other, and just making sure is regardless of who the service provider is for uh, for the guaranteed basic income, that the, the data and the reports still come back to the city of Santa Rosa for discussion, right. right? So even if it's First Five, I know First Five has its own board, they can do their own discussions about administration and, and the results of the program. But I want us to also have whoever the service provider is accountable to the city council uh, in making those reports and, and letting us talk about the data. 100%. So um, I did write into the contract um, that right now exists uh, that's coming to you for um, the uh, everything except for guaranteed basic income um, that they are required 
to follow the ARPA, the federal uh, uh, reporting requirements, and that those come back to us. So it is written into the contract at this point. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That that was it. <laughs> those are all our programs. Um, I think the process, if I'm to understand it correctly, is because the funds have been um, uh, council has seen and awarded and acted on the funds. At this point, I think it's just the program that the contracts would go to council on consent and um, details of the program uh, programs themselves um, would come back just as we've done today um, to say, yeah, this is, this is what we wanted. And so I think it only goes to the economic development subcommittee. Okay. Any other questions or comments, John or Victoria? No, good job, team. No, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing these dollars get in the hands of families. I think it's going to be really exciting. Probably stabilizing is what it's going to be, but it may, may in my head there's going to be fire fireworks. Yeah, it's uh, we're that's what we're going for. Great, thank um, you. Okay, we have one more item I think on the agenda. Yeah, let's go to public comment first on, on 3.1 here. I said we have at least, uh, we've got a couple of hands. Yes, um, let me go ahead and pull up the screen. Um, and the first individual will be, will be Mr. Eric Frazier. Mr. Frazier, if you could confirm your ability to see the screen and introduce yourself if you so choose. Yeah, thank you. I do see it. <clears throat> and uh, I can appreciate the work that's gone into these programs. And I'd like to say that I'd like to be proud of Santa Rosa, um, but there's a number of things that I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing really sound research, and I'm certainly not hearing about any metrics uh, in performance. That really concerns me, quite frankly. I know that the people that are assembled in this committee love to spend money. It's easy to do, but I don't really see where that's going to contribute to success without metrics. The programs that were raised uh, range in value, in my opinion. I'm not sure if some of the spend is really just sort of dedicated to our undocumented neighbors. Uh, not that I have anything against people that are here and undocumented or anything like that, but I'm wondering what that impact is going to be uh, and how that's gonna be perceived. Uh, the programs that you have that are really dedicated towards business, including the facade, grant program or whatever, truly is half-baked. <laughs> I mean, truly, you guys think you're in a position to roll into small businesses and tell them what their needs are? I mean, truly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, of course, that, that type of money is just sort of peed away. It's nothing that's really going to stick. It'll have some impact. It'll look beautiful. And certainly, you'll shoulder the voters. And so as you're pandering for votes, I'm sure it'll play well. But as far as a wise spend of money, it's pretty, uh, pretty vapid. <laughs> uh, the parklet program is even worse. You threw business under the bus with the fees that you wanted to charge. And now you guys don't even realize that the parklets aren't being used. Not only are they dilapidated, but you walk around, businesses aren't using those parklets anymore. And now you're encouraging more of a permanent installation, putting people in harm's way. Uh, I, I think that's a really, really half-baked. <laughs> and just for clarification, the partlets, partlets that you saw in the presentation are somewhere online. They don't, they're not representative of what's going here in Santa Rosa. And all this money spent, you're not even addressing the core things. Like for instance, certainly uh, council member Fleming remembers where a fine proposal went forward where there's a cost share program to get our sidewalks fixed. From you guys, crickets. You don't really care about the homeowners and historic districts. In fact, your latest actions with the short-term rentals indicate you really don't care about people that own property at all. You just want to beat up on them and make yourself look good with all this money. I think voters are going to see through that. It's unfortunate, but go ahead and brand it because it sounds like a lot of quagmires. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. We'll go on to gigs. Mr. Hightower, I'm sorry, Mr. Gig, if you would um, confirm your ability to see the screen. Yes, I see the screen. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'd like to uh, comment on the tenant improvement grants. 
So um, I think it's a, a good idea. And um, uh, I just want to point out that it's really a very big difference between the business owners and the property owners and what they get out of it. And um, so the business owner obviously is like looking at it as a marketing thing to bring you know more people being attractive but the the building owner has to look at the future uh, of the of the building and so um i'm not sure how the grant exactly works whether an owner can apply or only the um i mean a building owner landlord can apply or only the business owner can apply but I know you said that they have to have a letter to go with it. Um, but I would think a, a building owner may have more than one tenant and may like the idea of improving the facade, but they're different businesses. And so they wanna be the applicant. So I'm not sure if that's a flexibility in the, in the program or not. But the main thing I wanted to mention was that in terms of, you, you mentioned priority points. So I'm assuming the grant is competitive and there isn't enough money for everybody who applies to be funded. So it's, they're gonna be evaluated and you're, some are gonna get it and some aren't. So that's where the priority points come in. And I would suggest that you um, include priority points if the business owner lives in Santa Rosa rather than being a corporation or living you know, in another state or something or whatever. So if a business owner is applying and lives in Santa Rosa, they should get priority points. Same thing with the building owner. If the building owner lives in Santa Rosa, that should be a priority point. And rather than a, a corporation or some or out of out of state uh, owners. So, um, yeah, so I just just for the economic development, if the business owner and the building owner live in Santa Rosa, this should be a high priority funding. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. Great, thanks. We've got Ananda. Yes. Uh, Ms. Reed, if you would go ahead and confirm your ability to see the screen. I can, thank you. Hello, Ananda Sweet with the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. I'll be brief. I just want to take a moment to thank you. I thank the council and staff for really their hard work on you know, looking at uh, economic development initiatives that are really critical to both our economic recovery and our long-term economic success in Santa Rosa. So from sort of re-envisioning what uh, the downtown looks like and how parklets can be made into a more permanent uh, status and, and really that vision for a thriving downtown. And you know that's a critical piece of it. Uh, to your willingness to make some like serious investments, um, you know, that through an upstream investment lens, it's something that's a no-brainer to do. We have all the all the data in the world um, from you know rep replicable studies uh, from multiple economists, Nobel Prize-winning economists. Um, so we know exactly what the formula is, and I know that staff uh, took a real uh, great data-driven, evidence-based approach to look at some of those programs and where to get the most for those Santa Rosa funds. Um, but while it's a no-brainer, not every community has done that. So I'm just grateful that Santa Rosa has been a leader in this space. Uh, it's going to make a huge difference. Uh, and again, some that we'll see uh, really quickly as a current workforce issue and lack of access to child care, and some that won't come to us until you wait on the road after none of you are in office. So I really appreciate that sort of broad uh, economic impact lens and your willingness to take it on. Thank you, Ananda. I don't see any other hands. There are so I bring no, it back. I was just going to confirm there are no additional hands raised at this time. Excellent. Let's go on to 3.2. And again, for folks, remember that 3.3 .3 has been pulled for the day. Hey, I'm Tara Thompson back to present um, an exciting preview of a revised and reimagined Out There Santa Rosa website, which will be launching very soon. So this is a sneak peek. You're like the first ones to get a glance. <laughs> um, but Rice and I have been working with new consultants um, here in Santa Rosa to really re-look re at Out There Santa Rosa, our branding, our kind of destination marketing, 
um, and local pride campaign approach. And so I'm gonna share my screen to give you a little bit of a sense of what we are working on here. So one of the biggest components of this new site is a map of Santa Rosa. So we've worked with an artist um, to hand draw this map. It's not finished yet, this is a draft, um, but this is the idea and the direction that we're going, which includes some su little surprises, hidden Easter eggs, some icon iconic buildings um, or other landmarks uh, that really identify Santa Rosa as out there. <laughs> so um, the site has several sections, which are really supposed to all be all immersive, um, all connected as well. They all have their own look and feel. There's art, music, eat, drink, active, wild card, and you can also search by the neighborhood. And we're really looking at this as an insider's guide to what's out there in Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa is the urban center of Sonoma County. And we've asked locals to really talk about what are their hidden, favorite, unique surprises or places they like to visit here in San Rosa. So I'll just, I'll pick one of these categories, walk you through just a few, um, a few of the listings. Essentially, it's, it's a place where you can explore, but also get connected to artists. Um, here are some examples. For instance, 33 Arts, you click on it, shows you where it is, what it is. It's sorted by neighborhood. Um, Southwest links you to their connect, how, how it allows you to connect directly with that entity. Um, it includes a quote from an insider, an insider who we, we've talked to about all of these places. Uh, and then you can, you can keep exploring through through that page or you can go back um, to the main arts page and keep exploring. Um, so let me see, if we go to wildcard, for instance, we've got um, things like pop-up events, circus, uh, Safari West, the sky's the limit, taco, Tuesday rides, the Mercadito. So there's a lot, there's a lot to explore here. And um, and it's, it's super exciting. We've also added a feature that allows you to sort by BIPOC owned, LGBTQI owned and women owned. Uh, and you can also search by neighborhood. So uh, let's see, Roseland for instance. Um, and then it, it's, so if you're, if you're visiting and you want, you're gonna be visiting an area and you wanna go to see what's interesting in that area, you can sort by that neighborhood. But we're really trying to get the insiders, the people who live here, who run these markets, to um, share with us uh, how, how, you know, what's special about, about their place and what makes it out there to be included on this site. So, Raisa, if you want to add anything, go ahead. I just wanted to give a little bit of preview of what we've been working on here. Yeah, so um, we decided um, that we really, uh, we were so mimicked, I should say. I mean, I guess, uh, what is that uh, when... Uh, people do what you're doing is the best form of flattery, except that it became really kind of annoying that it wasn't differentiating us as the big city, the fifth largest city in the Bay Area, the largest city by far in Sonoma County. And so we're going with a totally different look um, and feel. And we're redoing it in terms of, as, um, as Tara said, really getting not just a curated thing, but it's, um, it's, really locals participating in local. So this is um, funded out of tourism. So it's geared towards, you know, originally towards destination brand, but it is fundamental in our uh, marketing for businesses, new businesses, workforce, because um, as I've said before, what we attract here is small businesses. We attract a type of person who will move their business here and then grow their business here if they're coming from the outside or want to stay here. And this is how we, um, we express to people uh, interested in understanding what Santa Rosa is, who we are. Um, and it is very different from Petaluma, 
who, as, as you may recall, sort of um, mirrored what our, our uh, branding was through our previous out there site. Um, the other thing is, it's um, we are looking for hidden gems or things that people don't understand. And you'll see on the backs, uh, the underlying graphic, um, it's there's uh, we have ways throughout this thing that sort of reiterate where you are, what you are, what category you're in, um, uh, so that it sort of cross connects, but again, gives us that sort of more cutting urban edge that we were looking for to differentiate ourselves. Um, and lastly, this is really used for, um, you know, broadly, uh, even the folks in Petaluma tell me that they generally send folks to our out there site when they're talking with businesses to, to, um, for them to understand what's here in the area. So um, yeah, this is where we are. We hope to launch it, I think in the next month, did you say, uh, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, um, so I think we'll we're, we're looking at uh, April, early April. Yeah, very close. Um, so yeah, that's your little sneak peek. Oh, and last thing, that BIPOC woman, LGBTQ, um, that was part of the um, our, our initial initiative through, um, what's that called, through uh, some of the things that we heard back through our strat planning. Uh, process um, is, uh, you know, we need to highlight and identify and highlight some of our um, uh, minority business groups that have received less, uh, have sort of less access, I guess. Um, so we do, did decide to highlight those. Excellent. John, Victoria. Great job. I, uh, could you go back to the map for me? I mean, we could, there's all sorts of directions someone could go in, in looking at this presentation. It's so, it's really exciting. I love the fact that it's so urban. Um, the, the one thing that I, I noticed, there's this really nice space right next to Bennett Valley um, that might include a golfer, but um, that's just because that's kind of my life right now. So um, that's why I, I don't, I don't think there's a golfer guy there or a golfer woman or what, whatever, a golfer. <laughs> But it would might be easy to throw so throw somebody in there with a golf club. <laughs> so I, I oh go on. Does Chris want to make a quip about golfing? No, I, I was trying to read whose cat lives here. <laughs> oh yeah. You know what's amazing is you know how people are so drawn in, especially to the Bud Snow shirts that you guys have with the SR out there. My daughter, every time I put one on. You know, she like grabs my shirt and like goes in and, and I'm always embarrassed that I don't have all the answers of what all the things are on it. But um, people just love that. Um, I did have one uh, kind of like John just, you know, I think we're all just drawn to in the neighborhoods that we live in, which is um, Northtown. Um, where is Northtown? I mean, I have a feeling I represent it, but I've never heard of anything in my district called Northtown. I haven't either. Yeah, it's, I, thought, it's like, I was like, maybe I'll just ask her offline so I don't embarrass myself. But no, I'm, it's OK. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, it, it was a fascinating exercise to research neighborhoods in Santa Rosa and to figure out what you call places that really don't have an agreed upon established um, name or or even geographical areas. So, I mean, we all kind of accept there's the, the quadrants north, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. Um, divided up by our freeways, but then, and, and then you've got Roseland, you've got South Park, you've got downtown, Midtown, but then what's that area, like there's a variety of residential neighborhoods north of downtown, what, 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 what is that in its entirety, you know, all the way up to um, like essentially the, the bottom of Fountain Grove, so that's, that's I, I mean, I consider, yeah, sorry to cut you off, I, I, <laughs> thought that that was the junior college neighborhood and we have an association the junior college neighborhood association does is that different from north town uh, it's a i would consider it be, to be a part of north town um we, we we did not call out all residential neighborhoods on this map right yeah okay. so yeah so we kind we were trying to find larger um geographic areas to lump together and and what would you call those things so that that's kind of it, it it's it was not an exact science it was definitely um a work in progress to kind of figure out how how we can uh, provide a layer of direction and kind of knowing where you are without um naming every single neighborhood okay well i love it i i would love to see the the jc neighborhood noted but um i, I your point is well taken 
understand. Thank you. I yeah, no, I, I, I'm looking forward to being able to put this up on uh, social media just to see what, what people think. So let us know when we can, because it, it will absolutely spur discussion of, and placemaking. Uh, and, and perhaps if we had done this a little bit sooner, maybe it would have changed the input that we've gotten on our redistricting. Um, <laughs> but it certainly would have been, been interesting to have uh, as a tool to talk to people about where they live. No, it's a great, what a, what a wonderful effort. I mean, that's just what a and challenging one. So mm -hmm. congratulations. Yeah, All right, very let's, cool. let's go to public comment on this item. I no, see okay. Eric. Uh, Mr. Frazier, you should be able to speak if you would confirm your ability to see the screen. Yeah, thank you so much. And of course, I appreciate you today. And I'm sorry that I've been teed up on so many issues, but this actually is one of them as well. It's a wonderful effort. But quite frankly, for the millions of dollars that BAA money that's spent by this part, this is the city's collection of that BIA. I would totally expect more from a user and distributor of tourism information throughout the state and country. This is incredibly disappointing, almost embarrassing. I can tell you if that map was in a printed form and available for our visitors, they would disregard it as pablum. What value is there in that information? The self-congratulatory nature of the presentation is nauseating. But the things that really wring out the emotion in me is that your financing is born on the back of an illegal scheme to collect BIA from residential properties. Over the 12 years that the BIA has been in existence, exceeding state law and guidelines, it's collected about $800,000 from residential property owners. When we go back years, we don't have accounting on how that money spent. The, this is atrocious, I have to tell you. And while I certainly, anybody who knows me, certainly knows me for being all in on economic development. And I don't blame the artists and the businesses here that want that sense of community. But you guys are acting in such an unprofessional way that I have to say something. I'm sorry I do, because I love the city and I love those maps like that. You know I do, I love the sense of purpose, understanding the history, but when I look at the stuff that you're doing, not only do I see people disregard it out of hand because it's nonsensical, it's ridiculous. It's like high school childhood drawings, even though I like Eric Martin, I like a lot of the art talent. Certainly I have my favorites, but your effort is, an embarrassment and it's scandalous unfortunately and i'm sorry to have to report that but i hope for better and maybe we can rally that but um right now i i feel like i've thrown up in my mouth a little bit sorry thank you eric uh, Ray said maybe we can put Eric's short-term rental on the map. Uh, might make it a little bit more appealing to him. Let's go on to gig. Nick, if you would confirm your ability to see the screen. Yes, I see the screen. Great, thank you. So I like the whole idea and uh, the map's kind of cute, um, but, but you made a big mistake. You got to redo the map. You spelled Juilliard Park wrong. I just cannot accept that. You've got to correct that spelling. It's J-U-I-L-L-I-A-R-D, Juilliard Park. You misspelled it, so that has to be fixed. And as long as you're fixing it, I never heard of North Town. There's no North Town in Santa Rosa. It's the JC neighborhood. So um, fix that as well. Otherwise, go for it, thank you. 
podcast. Thank you, Gig. And and I might need glasses. I have no idea how you were able to read the spelling on, on Juilliard Park, but we oh. will absolutely get that fixed. <laughs> so thank you. Let's go ahead and bring it back. Any other comments or questions from council members or staff? The only thing I can say is this is really a draft. Really a draft, yeah. And a beautiful draft at that. And we are so proud and self-congratulatory and unapologetically so. This is fantastic work. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, so as a reminder for the public, we pulled item 3.3. Raisa, do we have any department reports today? No, that was it. I think that's um, quite enough <laughs> for today. All right, I wanna thank staff and thank the council members and thanks the public for being here. With that, we'll go ahead and adjourn today's meeting. Thanks, Good everybody. job, team. Bye-bye. All right, bye.